Uh, cool. Well, uh, good afternoon. And um, well, nice to have you here. Got a smaller group today. So, um, well, that's good. Um, can get us um, all involved. So uh, what I want to talk about today is just quickly wrap up. There's one last detail from the last worksheet that we were working on last time. And um, so that would like wrap up the material in chapter two. And then we'll get started on the first couple of sections in chapter three, with which deal with hypothesis tests. Um, so at least kind of looking over your grades on the quiz, um, everybody did the quiz, awesome. Everybody got 100%, also awesome. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, there are, there might not, there might be some questions. So are, were there any questions about um, how we can read these quantile quantile plots, or in this case, normal quantile plots. They're tricky. Um, so I figured that might be something good to put in a video so that you can kind of rewatch it in case you um, missed the detail there. But these are quite nice. So the idea um, here is, right, we have a data set, which is from a sample. And we're trying to match this up with some theoretical distribution. In, in this case, normal distribution. So we're trying to see how good this sample would in theory fit uh, a normal distribution for the population. So that's a little bit different than um, what the empirical cumulative distribution function is. Um, so again, we're gonna assume that we have a sample of data such as these same um, exam scores over here. And so the empirical cumulative distribution function is basically just giving the CDF based on the data that we have. So we're gonna assume that this data is the population, come up with the CDF for this data and guess that the population has a similar looking CDF. So um, for large data sets, we would not do this by hand um, because this one is relatively small, uh, we can do this by hand. So the formula says here, we've got 10 things in our data set, I believe. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So our value for n is 10. And then I'm gonna say, okay, my first value is 55. So um, if x is less than 55, then we, we have nothing in our data set that's less than 55. So we have zero over 10, technically. Okay, then once we hit 55 up to, but not including the next value, 62, right? There was one out of 10 values in there. So we're gonna assume our population has about one tenth of the values between um, those. Okay, all the way down to um, nine out of 10 would be the second to last value, which is 91 up to, but not including 98. And then lastly, we would say um, 98 was the biggest value. So anything above 98 should account for about 100% of the values. So um, one distinction here is we have a one over n here. Um, and just recall that when we were doing um, the cumulative, the quantile quantile plots, we set that to be um, n plus one because we wanna include the possibility that there would be values in our population larger than the largest value in our sample. Uh, any, any questions? Um, okay, so in R, um, this is done pretty pretty easily um, with a plot ECDF function. And so what's being plotted down below should exactly match um, what we have, the function that we had above. And um, if you're looking at this 
code over here, we haven't talked about this necessarily. And that is um, if you want to enter a data set into R by hand um, here, you could assign it to a variable in R. So we've been doing things with data from our textbook, which is like preloaded in this resample data um, package. But if I want to create a data set, what this means, the C means column vector. So this means we're going to set up our data as one variable. We're going to write it as a column vector. That's what that command does. And then this command creates this graph that we have below from it. Uh, any, any questions about uh, this? So you'll have to do some, I don't think you have to do any by hand on the homework that's due next week, but you do have some um, to, you do have some e ECDFs to plot based on data sets um, in the resample data package. Okay, so um, if you have questions, maybe your microphone works, you can try asking that way. Um, I know mine is working because I, I heard uh, a hello. Um, otherwise, you're, you're welcome to chat them in. Um, I'll take the silence as a good sign. Good. Well, thanks, David. <laughs> okay. Um, so that kind of wraps up the part on exploratory data analysis. There, there are some additional things. There are sections after 2.5 in the textbook. Um, we're only going to cover stuff up to 2.5. Uh, okay, so then let's kind of change gears into the next section, which deals with um, hypothesis testing. Uh, so the homework, which is due on Monday, a week from today, um, is mainly on chapters one and two. We haven't talked about chapter one because it, it's um, mainly just kind of going through some definitions. I think it's easy enough um, to follow that. We did talk about chapter two the last couple classes. Um, so now let's talk about how we can do um, some hypothesis tests. So we're, we're actually not going to need R um, today to do these, but um, just be prepared. We're going to use R quite a bit on Wednesday to, to help simu do some simulations for this. So today I just want to talk about kind of the framework for hypothesis testing. Um, so the idea here is we have some claim that we're going to make about the population. And there's going to be two competing claims about the population. And that's important. Um, there shouldn't be any gray area between them. So these are going to be two claims that, um, you know, they both can't be true at the same time. They have to be competing claims. Okay, then you go, you set up an experiment, um, you collect data, and then based on that data, you kind of reassess which of these claims seems more likely to be true. And um, so this is kind of the, the tricky step there. And just some examples of statistical questions that could be answered with a hypothesis test are, um, are below. So I do some work um, in school of government and so these are the types of things that the students that I work with over there are kind of interested in. So we've done some work with questions like this. And we'll, we'll take a look at, um, in particular, uh, we'll, we'll see this one today actually with the uh, voting um, in mail. And maybe we'll come back to some of these ideas a bit later. So that's the, the goal. And so these two competing claims, we call these the hypotheses. And there's two of them. One of them is called the um, null hypothesis. And that gets denoted with a subscript of a zero for null. And then we have an alternative hypothesis, which gets a subscript of A. So the null hypothesis is going to be a really boring claim. And the alternative hypothesis 
is typically the thing that the researchers are hoping to prove. So the goal here is to collect some evidence that's going to say, hey, this claim in the null hypothesis is seems um, like it doesn't match our data. This is a probably a bad assumption, and thus this competing claim is, is probably true. And again, this is all based on statistics and sampling. So we can do all of our math correctly, and sometimes we just get incorrect conclusions based on biased data. Okay, so any questions so far before we take a look at some examples? You, you might have plenty of questions. Um, okay, so um, you guys are gonna make this hard because um, we're gonna try and do an, an experiment here. Telepathy works a lot better when I can see your faces, but that's okay. It actually works much better when we're all in the same classroom, um, but we'll do, we'll do a remote telepathy experiment here. So for those that um, don't know, telepathy is the ability to like communicate without words, non-verbally, right? Just with your thoughts. So if we wanna run an experiment, so here the statistical question is, right, do I have telepathy? And this is set up for a hypothesis that's because there's either two possibilities, right? I do or I don't. So in this case, which is the boring claim here? That you don't have telepathy. telepathy. Yeah, that I don't, right? I probably wouldn't need to convince you of that. That's probably what, what you think. And it's, my, it's on me to try and convince you of something interesting, right? Which would be that, that I do. So that's how, that's kind of step one in this process. Before we even collect any data is we kind of just figure out what is it that we're trying to um, prove? What would be the two possible competing claims? And then we think about an experiment. And again, this could go, you can think about different ways that you could do this. Um, if anybody is a fan of Ghostbusters, like the old original Ghostbusters, right? There's a good scene where they're like putting cards on the head and um, which one? I think Bill Murray is trying to do some telepathy experiments in that one. Check it out for any fans of old, old very old movies, I guess now. Um, so we'll, we'll think of a similar experiment here. So um, here are four letters, A, B, C, and D. I'm gonna think of a letter I'm gonna send it out there through the internet to all of you. And I'm gonna see how many of you guess the letter that I'm thinking of. So I'm gonna open up a poll. The poll is gonna say, what letter am I thinking of, A, B, C, or D? And we've got 11 people in here. Um, you would please participate in this poll. You're, um, I'm, I'm connecting to everybody here. Uh, so let's see, here's our polling. Okay, so first I need you guys to zone in here, thinking of a letter. Okay. Um, now let me open up the poll. Is that everybody? So. Okay, so I was thinking of C. That was the most popular answer choice. Uh, 
Um, so, okay, here, this I usually do when we have, um, when we're in the same classroom and thus we have more people. Um, so over here, we had um, eight people that participated in this poll. I think, is that right? Um, yeah, eight people. And we found that out of those eight, right, three people did get the right uh, amount. So according to the math here, um, this poll tell me that is 38% of the responders. So um, one thing to note here This refers to a um, sample proportion. So um, that's kind of a theme in statistics is we put, these are called hats on top of the P. We put hats on top of things when they are based on samples. So if you remember, um, we did the empirical cumulative distribution function, it had an F with a hat on top. So it's kind of the same idea. Whereas um, P, we use for a population proportion. Okay, so that makes a difference in theory, whether or not we have a hat on top of our P or not. So if um, I didn't have any telepathy, and you can imagine me doing this experiment with everybody in the world, opening up this poll, everybody in the world, tell me what letter I'm thinking of, results come back in, um, what proportion of the people would you expect would guess the letter that I'm thinking of? Three eighths. Uh, so, so three eighths was what we observed from our class. So if I did this for everybody in the world, you know, all seven some odd billion people, you would, would you expect me to get 38 per, or would you expect 38% of the people to get this right? Um, and I should say here, the assumption is um, Let me just say this, um, what I'm trying to say here is um, if the null hypothesis were true, okay, meaning I don't have any telepathy, what would you think this P would be? Maybe 25%. Yeah, so it'd be 20, right? Because we would just kind of say, it's not like nobody would get the letter that I'm thinking of. It would just be like, it wouldn't be any different from people randomly guessing. And so just by, you know, luck, you would think, you know, one quarter of the people pick A, one quarter pick B, C, and D. One of those things has to be my guess. So you would expect one out of four people to get it right just by guessing alone. Um, if the alternative hypothesis is true, then what would we expect P to be? Oh, it would be three eighths, right? It could be three eighths. At least it should be bigger. It should be something more impressive than random guessing, right? Yeah. So maybe we, you know, some people might say I would have to be 100% accurate, um, but we'll just say since we want to set up these claims to be, you know, competing with each other, one of them is true or the other one is true, we're going to state them in the following way that if I, don't have any telepathy, people would get things right, right one quarter of the time. And if I do have telepathy, then we would expect it to be more than one quarter of the time. Would you need tolerance on that uh, alternative hypothesis? Uh, what do you mean by, by that? So like, if you're sampling, you may, even though it's purely random, you may get like some 
larger than quarter. Yeah. Yeah. So it, this is the whole heart of it is like, okay, um, we all might have something different, right? So the question is, I got 38% of the, or, or at least 38% of the people guessed the letter that I was thinking of. 38% is more than one quarter. One quarter is 25%. So are you impressed is the question. Is that impressive enough? How much does it take to impress you? I think is what you're getting at. Um, and, th and that's a tricky question that depends on a number of different factors. And so that's why we're all here. <laughs> it's complicated, but we'll work it out. That's a really good question is like, how much evidence is convincing enough to reject this boring claim in the null hypothesis? Um, but just to, to back up here, that when we state our hypotheses, it's gonna be really useful to state these in words as well as to state them using notation. Uh, any, any questions? I have a question sort of yeah. related to you mentioning that this is purely based on data. So you could get like bias. Um, is the fact that you're searching the, that the problem is posed in a way such that you want, you want one thing and don't want the other thing. Would you be getting some like confirmation bias built into that as well? Uh, you could. Yeah. So that there are, different ways that bias can seep into your data. Um, confirmation bias is certainly one of those things. And there are ways that you can control for those types of bias by blinding or, or doing some other things. Yeah, so um, what's most important in this process is actually, I mean, it's important that we do the right analysis. What's equally as important is that we have a good set of data to work with, yeah. Yeah, so like specifically in relation to the null hypothesis and the alternative. So like it's being posed that you want to prove one thing versus not wanting to prove the other. Yeah, so the, the, the logical framework of hypothesis testing is always going to be the thing you want to prove is the alternative hypothesis. Okay. Yeah, so um, just by the the framework here, we're, we're kind of doing a proof by contradiction in, in some sense. Um, but the logic is um, we, we can't choose which thing is which hypothesis. It's always going to be the boring thing is the null and the thing we're trying to show is the alternative. So is isn't like what's boring, so to speak, subjective, you know, like you may have some researchers that think that this is the true or the more interesting hypothesis and then yeah, so we'll, think the opposite. We'll, we'll kind of talk about some tips that we can keep in mind so that we set up these hypotheses um, in accordance with, with the logic of doing these statistical tests. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and there, there is, you know, if you restate your alternative hypothesis to prove something else, then, then the analysis might, might pan out a little bit differently. Um, but let me just kind of, and I think I added this as, um, this might've been on this quiz um, that you did, I can't remember. So we have parameters and we have um, statistics. So statistics again, are things that come from sample, whereas parameters are things that come from that summarize a population. And the, the common ones that we use are P for proportion, and um, mu for a mean. These are mean and proportion of populations. And the corresponding statistics would be p hat, which is a sample proportion. Okay, x doesn't quite get a hat, it gets like a flat hat, it gets a bar. Um, and this denotes a sample mean. 
And so kind of the logic here that we want to keep in mind is that when we state these hypotheses, The, these claims are going to be about a population. If I did this to all people in the world, so we're going to base these claims, um, we're going to assess these claims based on the sample data that we get. And um, just to kind of throw in uh, another that we see quite often is sigmas for the standard deviation and then s is the sample standard deviation. Keep in mind the sd function that's built into r that's slightly different formulas to calculate um, standard deviation of a population or a sample. Um, r, when you use the standard deviation function, assumes you have a sample. Okay, so um, yeah, so let's kind of talk about some rules that we can keep in mind um, when we're setting up our hypotheses. So um, this will be kind of one of the questions on your quiz for next time. So um, please let me know if something's not clear. And this is what we'll spend time practicing today. Um, so first thing is what we just mentioned, and that is when we state these hypotheses, we're gonna state them in terms of population parameters. So we're gonna state these in terms of p's and mu's. And these are gonna be values that we're gonna claim something about them, but we don't know what the true value is. And so when you're stating your null hypothesis, we're gonna use an equal sign. Oops. Okay, and if you recall our example on the previous page, that was our claim that I'm just guessing. So that's gonna be equal to one half, one quarter. And the alternative is gonna involve some inequality. It, sometimes it might be greater than, sometimes it might be less than, sometimes it might be not equal to. And again, this is gonna depend on what the researchers want to Prove. So we'll go through some examples today where we'll see these different inequalities. Um, so hopefully it'll make sense kind of what language to look for in a problem to kind of recognize how to set up the alternative. But in the end, you know, our hypotheses are going to look something like this. And it's also good to explain what that means in words. Okay, and then we collect data. And then we calculate what's called a test statistic. So a test statistic is a statistic, meaning it comes from the sample. So these claims are about the value of the proportion of people that get things that get the right letter. In this case, our test statistic would be p hat, and that was the three out of eight. which I think came out to, was that what it was? Um, yeah. And then this is exactly the issue that um, Dan was getting at, which is, um, okay, is this close to, I mean, it's kind of close to one quarter. Is it big enough for one quarter? Um, does this convince you that you have enough evidence that I have telepathy? And um, we all might have a different threshold. There might be some people that say, I'm not gonna believe you unless you get 100% of them right. There might be some people that say, as long as you do a little bit better than 25%, that's okay. And um, you know, we don't wanna have a gray area here. Um, we wanna have some consistency in how we do these 
tests, we want to have some other researcher be able to check our work and run the same test and get the same um, conclusion. So just informally speaking, we say um, that a test statistic is statistically significant if it's very unlikely under the assumption of HO. So the null was that this is one quarter. If people were just randomly guessing, is this unlikely to occur or not? Right? The more unlikely this is, the more evidence that you have. So for example, P hat is 90%. Well, that would be extremely unlikely to happen if people were just guessing. So that I think would probably give you some um, reason to think that something interesting beyond just guessing is going on. Okay. Whereas if this sample wound up being like 0.26, you'd probably say like, hey, that, that's actually what I would expect to happen if your people were just guessing. But the question is, right, there's like a whole spectrum of values in between. What's the cutting point? So we'll have to put that on, on ice for now. We'll come back to that. It'll be nice and refreshing when, when we get to that. So um, at first, let's kind of focus on step one, setting up the hypotheses, okay? And um, there are some subtleties here. And in fact, you know, like in most math problems, step one is really important. Um, so here is an example, and you'll do some work with this example. Um, I, I put up a video that, that kind of takes this example a little bit further. And um, yeah, so um, just keep this example in mind when you're, when you're thinking about the video um, for Wednesday's quiz. So the idea here is um, this was a study uh, that was done in Israel. And um, this is what's called the unscrupulous diner's dilemma. And so the idea here is that when you go out to dinner or lunch or whatever the meal is, you know, sometimes you go out with people and you just kind of add up the bill and split it evenly. And sometimes you go out and people wanna just pay separately for what they ordered. And so these researchers were interested in, um, they were behavioral ec economists and they were interested in, you know, whether this affected people's behavior. In particular, they were suspicious that when people know the bill is being divided evenly, let me get your most expensive bottle of wine, right? Something like this. And then we're gonna spread the costs out among everybody. So they were suspicious that this might be happening. And, you know, we might not care too much about what people are ordering um, in, in dinner, but, you know, this same behavior you can imagine has some applications in environmental concepts. Like why do I, uh, I'm gonna continue polluting as long as I know everybody else is not polluting, right? And so it's kind of like, getting this herd mentality, I can go against the herd because I'm just one person and everybody else is gonna kind of even out my, my bad behavior, let's say. Um, so that doing it with dinner was something, uh, was a way that they can test this hypothesis. It was a little bit more of a concrete situation. And so when you're setting up these hypotheses, remember, the alternative is going to be what the researchers are, are wanting to prove, or wanting to show, what they suspect. So um, this is the key part here. So let, let's kind of just state these in words for now. And then we can come back and think about um, what we can, what parameters we could use to gauge these claims. Uh, I think I have this, no, I don't have this as a, as a quiz. So what, what would the, um, the boring claim be here? So the null would be, they order the same amount regardless of yep. whether they're splitting.
So we'll say, um, doesn't matter how the bill is divided, people pay the same no matter what. And then um, what's interesting in, 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 in this case, what is it that they're, they're hoping to show here? That if they know it's being split, then they actually do order more. Yeah, and that's right. Okay, so boring thing would be, it doesn't make a difference. What's the point of even wasting our time studying this? Interesting thing would be, and there are different ways that they could phrase this, right? They could be suspicious that people order more when they pay for what they order. And that would affect the way we're gonna state the alternative. It could have just been that we think it's gonna make a difference and we don't know whether that is a positive or a negative difference. So there are different things that the researchers to try and um, prove. And based on that, that's how they should set up their alternative hypothesis. They shouldn't do this as the last step. Um, any, any questions about that so far? Okay, so um, let's say the, the way that they test this out is they um, have a collection of people that volunteered for this survey and then, or this study, and then they just randomly assigned some people to tables where they were going to split evenly. They assigned some people to tables where they're going to pay for what they order. And then they looked at the mean amounts ordered by these two different groups. So let's say um, in this case, the mean amount for the control group, which is the um, pay for what they order, was $8.67. Um, I'll just say that this was lunch in Israel. So um, it was a little bit cheaper than um, what you might go <laughs> um, if you went out to dinner in Denver. Good luck paying $8.67 um, at most restaurants. Um, so in this case, what we're interested in is what would be the most statistically significant? And again, statistically significant means unlikely if HO were true and therefore it provides evidence in the direction of the alternative. So um, let me open this up. I got a poll actually, I think. So what do you guys think? Which of these four options or these four possible means would give us the most statistically significant result? Okay, take another 10 seconds um, if you didn't get your response in. Okay, so here were the results. And um, if we kind of go through them, if, if HO were true, Right, then we'd expect um, the treatment group, the even split group to pay about the same. Which was 867. 
And so we're trying to find stuff that contradicts the null hypothesis. So actually this and this would kind of match up with what would be the case if the null hypothesis were true. That would be pretty likely that we would get this other group ordered about the same amount of food. So um, these two were the most commonly picked ones. So that's good. We're kind of realizing that we want to get a mean which is quite different than the other group. We want a big difference in this because the claim is that there's no difference. But we need to make sure that we're not just looking for something that contradicts the null hypothesis, but also provides evidence for the alternative. So something like this would be evidence that the control group orders more, which is the exact opposite of what our alternative hypothesis would be. So we're looking for a big difference, but that difference should be in support of the alternative, which means we would want to find which um, mean, the, the larger the mean is for the other table, the better we're going to be. So hey there. even though 467 had a large difference um, from the, the mean, since it was in the opposite direction, it was not what we wanted. That's right. Even okay. though that might have had a larger um, difference, that's in the wrong direction. We want to get evidence that this other group is going to order more. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, if the alternative hypothesis were a claim that we think these two groups are going to order differently without implying one being bigger than the other, then um, we would just look for the biggest difference and not care which direction it was in. And then this would actually be the most significant. Yeah. But because we do care about that, um, we pick the bigger one. Um, any, any other questions? Okay, so um, let's restate these hypotheses in terms of um, population parameters. So the null claim was that there was no difference So stating that in terms of population parameters, we would use these mu's. Um, I could also claim mu even equals mu control. That would be the same thing. But um, there's going to be a nice reason why I chose to write this as, as a difference instead of um, equal to each other. I'm assuming because you can get how different it is, right? That's right. That's right. So what we're going to do is compare differences. So that's why it's going to be useful to state these in terms of what we would expect the difference to be. Yeah. And so in this case, the alternative is that um, we would expect that difference to be positive. And again, that's why we wanted to pick the um, sample that had 11 some odd because we wanted that difference to be positive. You could say mu control minus mu even is less than zero. I mean, there are different but equivalent ways that, that you could state these. And again, you know, we've got population parameters here. We have an equal sign here, and we have an inequality here. These are the main rules to, to keep in mind. And these are population parameters. So what you're thinking of is if all people in the world went out to dinner and they were going to split evenly, what would be the mean of all of those people compared to if those same people sat at a table and you're going to pay for what you order? So these are population parameters. So um, let's say then we go ahead and do an experiment where we have like eight people And we split them up into two tables randomly. Okay, so each table has four people. One table is told you're going to split evenly. And this is how the experiment went. They had more than eight people, but I'm just kind of simplifying it a little bit. 
So um, the data that I have here is um, not too far off from the values. I just picked it to be a lot smaller. And hopefully, we'll see why I wanted to start with a smaller um, data set. So then we would take this group over here. We calculate their mean. And because it's a sample, um, we would calculate that and refer to it as x bar. Um, and if my calculation is correct, I'm getting uh, 1123. And then we would take uh, the control group, that's these people, and calculate the mean that they ordered. And in this case, that's 867. I don't know why. I'm doing proofs in my other class. And so I just have like, whenever I see even, I just think odd. But, um, this is a control here. Would be uh, the 1123 minus the 867, which comes out to um, 256. It'd be uh, funnier if you had put like 2n plus 1 <laughs> for the odd. <laughs> we haven't gotten to, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, and yeah, and so. Um, just keep in mind, we use the T here to denote test statistic. So then I would compare this difference to these claims over here. And it's like the analogous situation for the mind reading thing, right? That's more than zero, but is it big enough, right? Does that convince you that that is a big difference? And that depends on a lot of things. It depends on how big our samples are. It depends on how much spread we have in the samples themselves and so on. So it's gonna depend on the sample size it's going to depend on standard deviations. It's going to depend on um, a couple of factors. I would, what I would think too is like the context of, so like if uh, an entree, like an item on the menu costs like exactly that amount, then obviously someone's buying extra. But if it's like small compared to like the lowest cost item on the menu, at least that's how I would interpret it. Yeah, you're right. It, it depends on a number of things. And that's another good one. I think what you're saying is like, um, you know, $2.56 is not a lot if people were ordering $50 worth of food. But when they're mm -hmm. ordering $8 worth of food, that, that could be a pretty big difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's right. So what we're kind of looking for is the more positive this is, the more convincing it is. But, you know, there's a lot of randomness involved. So if this person over here was flipped, if these two people got flipped, you know, when we were doing the placement, you know, maybe this person wouldn't order 15, but they look like they're ordering a lot. This person maybe wasn't hungry, they weren't ordering a lot. And just by switching one person, um, you might find out that this makes a huge difference in the statistic that we get. So that's what we want to check is, was this difference can this be explained just to the randomness of splitting up people? Or is this significant enough that the, this difference is more than just how we split up the people? So I'll just kind of <laughs> say this question is what I just said, right? Th these are the issues that, that we would want to think about. And again, that's what we'll, we'll learn some techniques to, to um, answer that question. Any, any questions? Okay, so here is um, another example. Um, so this was um, from an experiment done about 10 years ago um, and this, this came up in the 2008 election, actually. Um, in particular, um, Ted Cruz, still around, um, he was sending out mailers in Iowa that were trying to um, kind of guilt people into voting, um, letting them know that like, hey, 
your neighbors are voting a lot more than you, you should go vote, that kind of thing. Um, so for those that are kind of registered to vote, you, I've, I've gotten these in Colorado, these same sort of things. Um, different states have different rules, but I do get this thing in the mail that says like, hey, you're, you're not voting, you know, um, your neighbors are voting more than you and they know that you're not voting and they think you're an idiot, you should go vote. Um, those things are totally made up. If you get those in the mail, they're just totally making up those um, statistics. And they're just trying to pressure you into voting exactly like this experiment um, was looking at. So this experiment thought about different ways that you can try and encourage people to vote. Um, and they had different levels. I'm just going to take two of, two of them. So one of them was what we'll call like an intrinsic reward. Like you're doing your civic duty, it's the right thing to do. You should feel great that you're taking part in this process, which is, is true. Um, and then the other kind of treatment, and this went in kind of increasingly amounts of pressure would be something like this, not to vote because it's the right thing to do, but you should vote because all of your neighbors vote and if you don't vote, they're all gonna know that you don't vote. So with some external pressure being put on you. Um, so they did a study. They sent one mailer to some people to a bunch of randomly selected voters. They sent this other mailer to another group of randomly selected voters, and then they followed up on how many, what proportion of those people actually voted in each of those groups. So um, just to back up, if we're going to set up these hypotheses, it should we should look out for what is it that these, these researchers were trying to prove. And here they were trying to determine whether positive or negative pressure is, is more effective. So um, first step would be, let's set up our hypotheses. Um, so I have a little poll just to see how that's going. Um, so this is great. I'm getting responses. So this gives me some feedback, some positive feedback that you guys are listening in the black square. So that's great. Um, yeah, so there are two questions in this poll. Basically, what would be the null hypothesis? You got some options. What would be the alternative hypothesis? So these are, you know, possible sorts of questions that you could see like on the next exam. These are kind of nice, quick, multiple choice questions that really get at making sure you've got that first step done. And then, we, and then we'll um, state them using no notation. Uh, okay, so if you're still deciding, please take Another um, 10 seconds to get your best intuitive guess here. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So let's um, take a look at the results here. So for the um, first question, things are pretty divided. Um, most common answer was the correct answer, which is um, we're going to assume that it doesn't make a difference, right? So that would be the boring thing. It's like, what's the point of sending these things out? It doesn't make a difference what you send out. It doesn't affect their habits. So um, the null is going to be um, there is no difference, to put it simply. Okay. 
And that's essentially what it's gonna be every time, right? There's, there's no reason for us to look at this, you know, this treatment, this treatment, they're the same. And I'm paraphrasing here, um, these are stated better in the poll, um, the alternative is that there is some difference. That's right. So um, the alternative could have been any one of these differences. Like this one is you're gonna you're more likely to vote, less likely to vote. But these researchers were first just trying to say, does it even make any difference at all? So the way that we can um, think these would be now looking at a difference of two proportions. So I used um, P in int to be like the intrinsic pressure group and X to be the extrinsic pressure group. So the null hypothesis is simply that there is no difference And here's a case where we now would use a not equal to sign because there was no direction implied in their um, research question. Um, so I think we kind of skipped B and went straight to C. Um, or sometimes that, that's how it goes. You kind of might state the hypotheses first, and then our test statistic, right, would be the corresponding proportion of people that voted in, in each of these samples. So like maybe 500 people got an intrinsic um, pressure letter in the mail. How many of those 500 people voted? Maybe 400 people got the extrinsic pressure thing how many of those 400 people voted? Let's take the difference of those two proportions. And if this difference is big, positive, or negative, we'll consider that significant. And if this difference is close to zero, we'll consider that not significant. And we need to unpack what does it mean to be close or not close to zero, right? That, um, that's complicated. Um, so for those that um, got these hypotheses off here, um, you know, feel free to chat me or, or speak up if you have any questions about where, where these hypotheses came from. Is this along the lines of um, like sigma and physics? To where you have like uh, I think it's like si sigma significance. Or maybe I'm thinking of a different. It's uh, you're else I'm thinking of uh, alpha, um, like alpha? the significance level. I think you're probably thinking of um, this. Possibly. Yeah. So there is a component to this, um, which is called the significance level, And um, before we talk about the significance level, the, the next thing we'll talk about is a p-value. And so um, this is how we distinguish what is far enough from zero is we calculate the p-value of our data and we compare this to the significance level. Yeah, that, yep, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Yep, the same thing, yep. Um, yeah, and that's an alpha. We want to use a different A um, other than the A that we used over here. So um, here we use the Latin A for alternative, and here we use the Greek alpha for the significance level. Um, any any other questions out there in invisible camera off world? That's fine. If you guys are going to turn your cameras off, I get the right to heckle you. So that's okay. It's in good fun. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, okay. So um, if there aren't any other questions, that's right. So then like the next component to this is how can we quantify like what it means to be extreme? And th that's what the p-value measures. Um, 
And there's lots of ways that people misinterpret p-value. So we just want to be careful. Um, it's not telling me the probability that any one of these hypotheses or is right or wrong. The p-value, and this is kind of the problem with this frequentist approach in statistics, is it's a measurement of how bizarre my sample is. And based on that, I can make some decisions about the hypotheses. So this is really measuring um, how likely are you to get a sample that's even more extreme than the one that you observed if the null hypothesis were true. So we're gonna operate this test all based on the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So by assuming the null hypothesis is true, we're gonna have some underlying distribution for the population parameters. And then we can see where does our sample fit into the corresponding sampling distribution. Um, but we'll kind of get our way there. Um, and so what we say is the smaller the p-value is, that tells me that this means my sample is extremely unlikely to occur if the null hypothesis were true. My sample contradicts the null hypothesis and therefore we have evidence to support the alternative. So what we want to get is, and it can be confusing, like so for this example, we would want a big difference. So we want this to be big and that's going to make the p-value small. So um, just to give you like a little sneak peek into how these things go. And we have proportions here. So if the null hypothesis is claiming that P1 minus P2 should be zero, and then I get a sample that's over here, the question is, is that extreme? I have a negative difference. And the way that we measure that is we would say, well, how likely are we to get a sample that's even more extreme than that? And depending on our alternative, we would also consider big differences to be extreme. And the area in these tails is going to correspond to the p-value. And so if these observations are far away from the claim in the null hypothesis, we should expect that area to be pretty small. There's not going to be a lot of samples that are going to be more extreme than that. So um, yeah, this is the key fact here. Um, what are we hoping for? Small p-values. Um, and the other thing to be clear about is what is the p-value measuring? It's a measurement of how unlikely my sample is, okay? Not a measurement of how unlikely the null hypothesis is. So there's a distinction there. So you would want to be, or you would be hoping that your sample is representative of the population. That's right. So if, and if you do it randomly, it will be. Um, yeah, and, and this kind of goes into different kind of sampling techniques that, that you can do. Um, but yeah, that's a step you don't want to take lightly. Um, you want to get some good data in order to do this analysis. So for example, you know, if we're doing like the, you're, you're going out to dinner, are you going to order differently experiment? You wouldn't want to take like the first four people that come, we're going to put you at this table. The next four people, we're going to put you at this table because there might be like people that come early might just be more inclined to eat. They might be hungry, right? So they got yeah. there early. So this is why you, you wouldn't assign people, you know, you come, we're gonna flip a coin, uh, you're going with this table. And, and that's the least biased way to do it. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, okay, so um, awesome. I think we are gonna, get through our worksheet for once um, completely. Um, and then we'll be in good shape to um, pick up with worksheet 10 next time. So what I want to focus on now is we've talked about how we set up hypotheses. We've talked about you know how we can, what would be reasonable test statistics. And we have like an informal idea of what it means to be statistically significant. 
let's firm that up with, you know, how do we actually calculate these p-values? And there are different ways that we can do it. Um, so uh, this way is going to be with what's called a null distribution. So you'll have something on your homework assignment that's due next Monday that's kind of similar to this example. And then on Wednesday, we're going to take a simulation-based approach to this. So we're going to need R. Okay, so we're going to get R to help us do some computations with this. So um, just be prepared on Wednesday um, to um, work with R. So let's kind of return back to this telepathy example. And let's take a look at the real data. So we had um, three out of eight. I'm just going to adjust those for our actual data. And um, this is a binomial. This example with telepathy at this. So the way we calculate the p-value is Let's assume um, everybody has a one fourth chance of getting this right. And it's independent, all right? Whether this person gets the right letter is independent of whether the next person gets the right letter and so on. So let's kind of consider if this were the case you know, how many people would we expect to get the correct guess out of eight attempts? And so that's why this is a binomial sort of calculation here. This p-value in this case would be what's the probability that more that three or more people out of eight got it right, right? Because we're looking for as or more extreme. So we include three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So um, different ways we can calculate this. Okay, one of which would be to do this. So rather than add up the probability of three, four, five, six, seven, we'll just take what is the probability of getting zero, one, or two right and subtract that from one. Um, and let me, if anyone has R open. Feel free to share. I don't. I have zero point three two one five. Zero point three two one five. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, my R is slowly opening. I'm just afraid it's going to cut me off from all of you. Um, so yeah, let, is, do I have a second for that? Oh, just open. You said 0. 0.3214. Uh, yeah. Five. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was just bumped up. Yep. Good. So, um, what this is telling me is there would be a 32 0.15% chance
where again, we, we have this assumption about the population parameter. Um, and so maybe that's not so remarkable, right? Um, and then the question is, you know, do we consider that likely or unlikely? I don't know, I would say 32%. Um, I would need more evidence myself to be convinced that someone has telepathy. If that were like 3%, okay, now, now maybe we're talking, right? Um, so we want these things to be um, beyond the reasonable doubt, I'll say. It's almost like being on a jury. And so 32%, if you were 32% that's sure that someone um, was guilty personally, that's not enough you know, for me. There's some doubt there. But if you're like 95% sure, okay, maybe, maybe that's enough. I don't know. I'm also like, I feel like that's a, a lot of pressure. <laughs> I want to be really, really sure. Um, okay, so this um, distribution that we had up here, this binomial distribution in, is what's called the null distribution. So this is the distribution of the test statistic, which in our case was T, if the null hypothesis were true. So all of this process is going on under the boring assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So for this case, our null hypothesis is going to be a binomial distribution with um, n, we had eight people, and the probability of a success was one quarter. So that gives me some distribution, right? There is some distribution in the background. Um, and then we're calculating, ah, okay, maybe here's three. How likely is it that that, that would happen? Um, but we'll, we'll kind of feel, fill in these um, details as we kind of move forward. So um, this is a really special case where we are able to pin down what the null distribution is. Um, the video that you guys will look at will be with the intrinsic, um, no, it's gonna be more with the dining problem and you'll see we're gonna have a problem in that we don't have enough information to set up a null distribution. So we're gonna approach that in a, in a different way using what's called a permutation test. Um, so that's the point of chapter three. So um, I want you guys to kind of go through the gist of one of them on the video, answer some questions on the quiz, um, and then we'll be able to go through different types of permutation tests together next time, um, all using R. Sweet, two minutes early, it is 3.13. Um, that's a uh, wrap for today, so enjoy your extra minutes. Um, but if you have some questions and you wanna stick around, um, feel free. Um, working through your exams, I am pretty confident that I will get them finished tomorrow. So I'll um, send an announcement to you all once um, those grades are, are up. Um, but otherwise, if you've got questions on the homework, um, I would definitely encourage you guys to get going on it really soon. Um, it's a lot of work in R for the most part. Most of, a lot of it can be done in R, so that's great. Calculations will be a little bit quicker, but you just need to be able to um, make sure you've got the right R commands. Um, so if you have any questions, you and I um, can definitely help you out. Otherwise, I'll um, see you guys on, on Wednesday.